Hello and welcome to the British Library South Asia seminar series, uh, which is part of our research and digitization project called Two Centuries of Indian Print. Our talk today is called No Longer a Nawab, the making of a new Hyderabadi Muslim. And we are very delighted to have amongst us Professor Afsar Muhammad. Uh, he teaches in the Department of South Asian Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. His previous work, The Festival of Peeds, Popular Islam and Shared Devotion in South India, published in 2013 from Oxford University Press, has generated a debate about various modes of locally produced living Islam and Hindu-Muslim exchanges in South India. He's now working on a new book using various literary and oral historical sources as related to the police action of Hyderabad of 1948. We are also very happy to have amongst us Professor Benjamin Cohen uh, as a chair for this uh, event. Uh, Professor Cohen teaches in the Department of History at the University of Utah. He's a scholar of South Asia with a particular interest in the early modern and modern periods of the subcontinent's history. He's the author of Kinship, Kingship and Colonialism in India's Deccan, uh, published in 2007 in the club Associational Life in Colonial India, published in 2015, and An Appeal to the Ladies of Hyderabad, Scandal in the, in the Raj, published in 2019. Now about the format of our session today, Professor Mohammed is going to speak to us for about 40 to 45 minutes, after which there'll be a short discussion between the chair and the speaker, after which I will open it up for audience questions. If during the talk or during the discussion, you would like to put in your questions, please use the chat box or the Q&A box to do so. And I will take the questions in order during the Q&A down. So without much further ado, I hand it over to Professor Afsar Muhammad to speak to us today about no longer a Nawab, the making of a new Hyderabadi Muslim. Over to you, Professor Muhammad. Thank you so much, uh, Priyanka Basu and the British Library team for this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Benjamin Cohen, who is always my inspiration as related to Hyderabad work. Thank you all for making this talk and I look forward to your feedback and questions. Basically, this talk is a segment from my uh, chapter, one of the chapters from the forthcoming book, No Longer in Above, The Making of a New Hyderabadi Muslim. In 2006, during the field research for my previous book, The Festival of Peers, At some point in September, I took an early morning bus to Karim Nagar, an urban town famous for the public rituals of Moharam, more than 100 miles away from the city of Hyderabad. This urban town has significant population Muslim population immensely influenced by the Shi Islamic practices of Hyderabad too. In this town, I met 78-year-old Abdul Khudu Sahib, who at first started talking about the early days performances of the songs of Mahara around the times of the police action of 1948. After a while, he surprisingly took a detour to talk about the police action and tell how his youthful dreams were shattered due to this extremely violent and traumatic event. Being a young man of around 20 years during this violent event, Kutu Sahib was one of the witnesses of the police action and the consequent divisive politics that partitioned Muslims and Hindus. According to Kutu Sahib, it was a nightmare for us as every Muslim in the Hyderabad state had suddenly become an enemy of the people, experiencing the height of every form of hatred that could not even step out of the home. 
growing up in such a hateful environment kutus own story offers a lens to speak about both external and interior struggles of many muslims during this period before this tragedy he was known for his mesmerizing performance of the songs of muharram both in telugu and urdu when the police action was executed between september 13th and 17th along with many aspects this narrative performance too according to kutus sahib started fading out kutus sahib said the police action was an end of many good beginnings in our lives we lost not only many friends our personal careers houses and the most importantly the beautiful life ihsan of our shared culture if someone says it is just about few muslims no not at all it is a pain about the entire community of the then haider since then these words stayed with me however it took me a while to return to this research on the police action as i had a hard time finding sufficient sources even to write a brief piece when taking notes from my previous work i had noticed that many witnesses who were mentioning about various writers cultural activists and literary texts between 1948 and 1956 in the process when i started reading fictional writings memoirs and autobiographies of this period then i had realized that i need to dig more alternative archives such as oral histories and literary written narratives focusing on the old city of hyderabad of the late 40s i will discuss how the new generation of muslims had struggled to remake their everyday lives that were totally destroyed by this police action what scholars such as umar khalidi ajay nurani taylor sharman sunil pushottam described as the destruction of hyderabad the hyderabad massacre at the third front of march many witnesses from my field work between 2006 and 2019 have described the entire violence as almost comparable to partition the larger project raises key questions related to many dimensions of the making of hyderabadi muslim identity the fear of muslim presence the idea of pakistan as articulated in local context constantly shifting hindu muslim interactions gender aspects and the conflicts between the majoritarian and minoritarian discourses majorologically speaking how could we make connections between oral histories of cultural figures such as abdul qudus sahib and various other written narratives about this traumatic period before that i am going to give a brief description of what happened during the covid action in 1947 on august 15th as the new nation states of india and pakistan preferred to negotiate land and power their borders were bloodied by the violence of the partition but india's territorial disputes were not limited to its western boundary indeed the citizens of the princely state of hyderabad had experienced the unraveling of an intense political and religious conflict between the union government of india and the local ruler the nizam of hyderabad to control the local power of the nizam and his private army namely the razakars the union government of india deployed the central army with a code name called operation polo popularly known as police action in general and police charia in telugu during these gruesome five days according to the pandit sundarlal report thousands of muslims who were either killed or were forced to migrate to pakistan this side of the story of an endless violence migrations and survival of muslims is still marginalized in the dominant historiography of hyderabad even the report of the pandit sundarlal and khazi abdul ghaffar who visited the affected areas in november and december of 1948 was not made public thanks to sunil pushottam efforts this report is now available despite its first ever disclosure of such violence during and after the police action sundarlal commission's report remained suppressed 
until recently as the Indian government considered, considered it to be harmful to national interest. In his book, Hyderabad After the Fall, Umar Khalidi documented several reports and at least writings about the police action, what he called the Hyderabad Holocaust. The local newspapers had extensive coverage of this Muslim butchering en bloc. In one of the conversations, Imam Hussein, an 80-year-old witness of the police action, told me, in fact, I was not even aware that we gained independence from the British rule and they already left India forever. When the entire country was joyously celebrating the new Ajadi, we Muslims in Hyderabad were devastated by the police action and we were struggling hard to save ourselves on a daily basis. Scholars on the Hyderabadi studies have discussed about how this notion of Ajadi independence was a recurring theme in almost every discourse during the 40s. However, for a Muslim such as Imam Hussein, the very concept and the language of Ajadi was elusive and remains an unsettling question forever. In such an environment, how do we understand the positionality of a non Muslim writer? who identifies himself with the broader Hyderabadi Muslim community. Whereas the witnesses such as Khudu Sahib and Imam Hussein clearly express their disappointment and frustration with the newly formed nation state of India and its nationalist narrative, Swami also emphasizes the similar viewpoint by describing this movement as an end of an era, Yugantam, in his Telugu short stories, Charmina, titled after the famous monument in the city of Hyderabad. On the other hand, within the history of modern Telugu writing, the genre of short story played a distinctive role in uncovering the marginalized lives in the city of Hyderabad and Telangana. Various long narratives such as novel focus on a nationalist portrayal of local heroes, short narratives such as stories and personal essays contest the national narrative and provide resistance from the below. In this case, the organized lawyer, lawyer and middle-class Muslims of Hyderabad. Indeed, the title of Swami's collection, Charminar II, in many ways represents the life world of Swami and his political vision that centers on a Muslim-centered narrative. Since the positionality of a non-Muslim writer speaking about Muslims is in question, I also need to respond to uh, questions such as who was this author during the late 1940s and why he was deeply concerned about the Muslim community or their Sri fashion subjectivities. Many of his friends, when sharing their memories about Swami, told me rather than a writer, Swami was more an activist during those days. Whereas the specific period of the 1940s represents several strands of modern and reformist debates in the larger Islamic world, I suggest that the case of Hyderabad-based Muslimness offers us a quite different example, one of an entirely modern Islamic hate milieu. The short stories published during and around this period seem to function as a site of tension between the normative expressions of Islam and the shifting paradigms in the everyday life of Muslims in Hyderabad. Swami's Muslim characters show how these two mutually connected concepts deal with gender equality, social justice, pluralism, and an emphasis on a minoritarian discourse, which are the key ingredients that shaped an alternative Muslim identity in the aftermath of the police action in Hyderabad. The production and circulation of such an intriguing discourse led to the creation of what we can call a version of the new Muslim, Naya Musulman, in the history of Hyderabad state during the turbulent forties. This idea of a new Muslim is closely connected to the making of modern Hyderabad, which several witnesses described as Naya Hyderabad in Urdu, or Adhika Hyderabadu, or Kota Hyderabadu in Telugu. By connecting the imaginary of Swami's fiction and the reality of these oral histories, the idea of the new Hyderabad and its composite religious culture, known popularly as Hyderabadi Tehzeeb, 
has always been a key component in the rise of a modern and progressive Muslim self after the police action. Born in the city of Hyderabad, Swami was one of those people who take pride in Hyderabad and use a tagline of Paidaishi Hyderabad, meaning Hyderabad born. During the times when most writers and cultural figures were trying to disown both Hyderabadiness and Muslim element in their personality, Swami never hesitated to declare his emotional attachment to the city and Muslims. His, ref his friends recall the statements such as, I am old Hyderabadi to the core. I grew up being half Muslim and half Hindu, while I should say I have more of that Fatis world Muslimness in my personality. Swami's term Muslimness has many dimensions that mark the making of Hyderabadi religious identity. Hindu Muslim shared devotion, shared devotion, Buddha sphere as a new model, and the legacy of the old city of Hyderabad. Many of his characters at some point of their life make an explicit statement that, as the title of this talk suggests, they are no longer Nawabs, and they constantly articulate a desire to remove or liberate themselves from the chains of the past. To begin with a very simple idea, these Muslim characters in Swami's fiction point out the tensions between tradition and modernity as manifested in the everyday life in the crucial turn of modernity in the Hyderabad state that shows certain similarities with the broader themes in the Deccan literary tradition. Most of the ideas circulated by these Muslim characters, however, demonstrate a life for an embedded in the pluralist ethos of the Deccan Islam. Each Muslim and Hindu character in Swami's work is positioned in a way that they unequivocally challenge the stereotypical narrativization of Nawabi-centered Muslim discourse in the city of Hyderabad. In this talk, I will focus on two characters from two stories, which I argue function as testimonials for a multidimensional Muslim belonging. For instance, in the story titled Vimukti, Sultan, the protagonist of the story, stresses his subjectivity and longs for freedom from the brutal authority of the Nawabi practices that produce class and gender inequality. Contesting the age-old practices and gender discrimination, Sultan writes a letter to his amma before leaving for Aligarh with a Muslim servant maid. Amma, please do forgive me. I have done two things that would be unacceptable to you. First, I have come far away from the contrived atmosphere of our Nawabi families that are steadily in decline. I have come here for good, far removed from loathsome customs and demeaning attitudes. Please don't look for me. I shall not return. Writing this letter was a defining moment in the life of Sultan in this story, Vimukti, liberation. Against the long history of Nawabi and Ashrafi practices of his family, this act of writing a letter itself was a groundbreaking move and signified his desire to embrace a version of modern Islam and reformism. Along similar lines, the entire literary corpus of Swami and his imaginary of Muslim men and women persistently asked, when will the real liberation dawn in place of the static, rigid, and loathsome Nawabi ways of life? And what should be the role of Islam? For Swami and his fictional characters repeatedly use the term modern Islam in this liberated space. Like Sultan, most characters try to define the contours of this liberated space within the locale of Hyderabad, thus drawing thick lines between tradition and modernity. Witnessing the troubled times of religious conflict and the rise of various new discourses of nationalism, liberalism, secularism, and Marxism, Swami's characters present evidence that responds to the new Muslim question. Like many of Swami's stories, the story Vimukti was also set in an intensely emotional and private setting of a family. 
that the so-called private space was never really a private setting as it was always filled with multiple characters from different classes and castes, thus making it a theater of political and social dimensions of, dimensions of the 1940s Hyderabad. Portraying the larger social, religious, and political networks, Swami uses the lens of individual to show the thick line between these two characters, two categories of Muslim, one confined to traditional authorities of structure who stick to age-old Nawabi practices, um, which they read and interpret as Islamic, and the other, a progressive Muslim who takes a pride in new modes of education, reformist Islam, and alternative gender debates. Swami's entire literary corpus prioritizes this new set of political and personal anxieties, including but not limited to other aspects such as the rise of an extremist Rajakar politics, a progressive group of Muslims, the migrations from Hyderabad to Pakistan, the systemic dehumanization of Muslims who were disciplined by different optics of political setting. Indeed, Swami's characters document the swiftly evolving socio-political networks of this new individual, Muslim individual, who blends local and global Islam as well. Unpacking the complexities of these contemporary networks, Swami's stories explain how this new Muslim subjectivity emerges out of the debris of the extreme violence and politics of hate in the late 40s. And Sultan's portrait functions as a testimony to this emerging discursive space and our space of an alternative Muslim discourse. Born and grew up in extremely conservative Nawabi family, Sultan's education at the Aligarh Muslim University allows him to cultivate a modern self originated from the concepts of individual freedom, gender equality, and social justice. Unlike Sultan, his brothers Siraj and Mira, Mirza represent an extension of the Nawabi practices. In a way, Sultan and his brothers are positioned at diametrically opposed viewpoints, representing the young generation of Muslims in Hyderabad. Juxtaposing these two viewpoints from the Ashrafi family provides an opportunity to understand how the upper class Muslim community was dealing with a modernist social thought of the 40s. In contrast, Sultan develops his own perception and outlook towards various personal and religious matters as well. Despite endless intense arguments with his family, Sultan fails to convince them about his modern understanding of the age-old feudal practices. Through the image of Sultan, Swami in this story shows the impact of new discourses related to Islam and progressive ideologies as circulated by institutions such as the Aligarh Muslim University and the locally active progressive movement in Hyderabad. In many ways, Sultan's image represents the key movement of the rise of an angry young Muslim who was totally frustrated with a normalized and rigid Nawabi Ashrafi Muslim lifestyle. Most importantly, the inability to adapt to modern modes of life. In the process, Sultan was not only contesting the family's adherence to the age-old practices in the name of Islam, but also defining a new Muslim identity that champions a modern and progressive social outcome. Indeed, it was a critical moment not only for Sultan, but for many young Muslims who were witnessing a major shift in the political and religious lives of their community in the aftermath of police action. Although it was limited to a family setting, when Sultan was dealing with these issues, he was participating in a wider public discourse about Islamic reformism that he seemingly adopts from various modern sources, including Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan's legacy of the Aligarh movement and the local debates about modern social religious thought in the city of Hyderabad. While urban locality, Basti, defines the text and texture of Swami's short story, the entire narrative comes full circle with the thick descriptions of interior processes of the local Muslim situated historically in late 40s Hyderabad state. Sultan as a character and Swami as an author both actively participate in this discourse of post 1940s Islam in Hyderabad. Of course, short story functions as a narrative framework 
uh, for this goal. In the story, Yugantam, the end of an era, Swami explores the question of newly drawn dividing lines between Hindus and Muslims, the loss of mutual trust and the fear of Muslim figure, the connections between the personal and the political that are resulted in the end of a shared religious and collective life in the city. Swami clearly identifies the points of rupture and builds his stories around those intense moments. For instance, Dilawar in Yugantam, Dilawar's extremely ordinary middle-class life turns into a political story with a rupture created by the idea of an estate, Islamic state and the two nation theory. Whereas many nationalist historians describe this moment as a liberation, for Swami, it is an end of an era, Yugantam. Karen Leonard analyzes how everyday life in the city offers evidence of a successful plural society. Explaining the, the contours of the pluralist network throughout the city, Leonard shows how this is evident not only in the court and administrative culture, but also in the urban culture, as well as the Indo Muslim and Mughalai at the neighborhood and even household levels. All who lived in the city, especially in the neighborhoods, of the old world city participated in the dominant public culture, regardless of their religious affiliations and private religious observances. observances. Despite this heavy emphasis on everyday pluralism, the consequences of the police action clearly led to the destruction of this mutuality, what Nurani describes as the destruction of Hyderabad itself, gradually separating the community into Hindu and Muslim categories. Swami's description of this separation provides rich evidence of such a destruction of mutuality. This separation has other implications too, such as the anxiety of belonging and the two nations. The two phases that led to the minoritized identity of Muslims in the post-police action Hyderabad. Swami's character, such as the lover, portrays this tragic irony of the problem of the minority precisely by locating them in the political setting of Hyderabad. Various several fiction writers, particularly in Telugu, ambiguously refer to the events of the police action in their fictional accounts. Swami's story, Yugantam, begins with a precise and particular date, reading more like a page from a historical account. This is how the story begins. September 15th, 1948, it was the third day of the police action. In Hyderabad, we were sitting really close to the All India radio, listening attentively, lowering the volume. The radio says that the Indian army was invading the Hyderabad state. Most importantly, the troops were arriving faster into the city, now almost 50 miles closer. The city will be soon cordoned off from the east, meaning Vijayawada and the west, Sholapur. Just today or tomorrow, these troops will enter the city. We're not sure why the troops from the other directions were not fast enough. Hyderabad was exclusive. The Deccan radio was broadcasting the developing news almost 24 hours continually. According to the news, the Hyderabad State Army, including the Itihadal Muslim Razakars, were chasing the Indian Army, and the radio stations boastfully declared the bravery with slogans such as Long Live Hasim Rajvi and Ajad Hyderabad very soon. That was the first segment in the story. Situating the narrative time and space right at the epicenter of crisis situation, Swami indeed provides a political testimony of the very early days of the police action in the early phase of the mutual distrust, mutual distrust between Hindus and Muslims, beginning with a description of the everyday climate of those four days that led to the destruction of Hyderabad, Swami blends the personal and the political. In the above segment of the story, Swami also describes the politics of media by referring the two conflicting news reports that were in circulation, Deccan Radio of the State of Hyderabad and All India Radio of the Union Government of India. Being an Urdu script writer at radio, Deccan Radio, Swami witnessed many historical events that shaped the state of Hyderabad and Telangana. Until the police action, Deccan Radio was a center of multicultural legacy of the Hyderabadi pluralism that highlighted the shared practices of modernity and uh, in Urdu and Telugu. In many ways, 
this radio encouraged the emerging modernist writers and poets who were part of the pluralist discourse of the 40s during the police action however the can radio confined itself to upholding the political authority of the nizam the story begins with a climate that epits a wave of mutual distrust and fear that engulfed the entire community in hyderabad swami tries to capture the idiom of such an intense movement of hatred where when even a friend appears to be an enemy or suspicious entity according to godur sitaram who was the editor of this volume of short stories and a close friend of um, swami the entire community had experienced an unprecedented tragedy on the dividing lines between muslims and hindus by labeling the community as us memo and them world at swami's treatment of various muslim characters and contexts showcases an exemplary narrative model as he implies a pluralist lens defy defying the idea of us memo and world them in the process he recounts a rec- compelling story of the othering of the muslim by unraveling the multi-layered psyche of the middle class muslim who turned into a razaka the private army led by hasim bazvi the protagonist in this story might not be a true representation of an ordinary muslim but the way swami portrays him helps the reader to comprehend the separation of hindus and muslims in addition he depicts the physical and psychological distancing of muslims by providing a thick ethnography of the endlessly changing neighborhoods particularly in this story narrating the pathetic journey of the hindus and muslims of hyderabad from distrust to distrust friendship to hate and tolerance to intolerance the story is a compelling testimony of the growing hatred in the society in the society despite the empathy towards his muslim friends the narrator now filled with fear and suspicion laments the separation of hindus and muslims using the explicit categories of us and them describing the situation from the perspective of a hindu swami's character here exposes the fear and trauma caused by the very presence of muslims and the activities of the razakas too as the story unfolds swami describes how life in the neighborhoods was this had undergone a massive change physically and then psychologically the story walks the reader through the narrow lanes of the city which were by then visibly segregated into muslim and hindu spaces significantly the descriptions about the work spaces about the partitioning of hindus and muslims in addition swami makes a clear distinction between an ordinary muslim and a razakar by exposing us to the human face of the dilemma throughout the story he documents several muslim characters as the victims of the theory of the two nations and then portrays how their lives were further complicated by these razakars various swami's other stories depict the socio cultural consequences of the police action yugantam deals particularly with the consequent shifts in hyderabadi muslim politics at the outset it is about two dear friends one hindu name is swami note again the autobiographical feature here with the writer giving his own name to the narrator of the story the other a muslim dilawar the protagonist in the story amid such turbulent and susceptible situation and even more in the middle of the night swami's friend dilawar drops in also swami and his mother usually consider dilawar as a family now at this midnight hour and particularly after the police action they hesitate to open the door and let him in a long time friend now becomes a suspicious entity and a stranger too after hesitating for a while they let dilawar in and during their conversations they learn about dilawar's recent metamorphosis into a follower of asim razvi while dilawar had committed countless atrocities of late he had started to feel betrayed ever since the nizam surrendered to the union government dilawar had been anticipating that the nizam would continue and the rizakas would be successful in creating an islamic state model on pakistan after the nizam surrender dilawar was forced to leave 
incognito as the state police was chasing. Towards the end of the story, the totally disenchanted and frustrated Dilawa decides to migrate to Pakistan to escape the state violence further complicated by the hatred of his friends. Towards the and then non-Muslim narrator towards the end of the story articulates his absolute disenchantment with the outcome of the police action. Parallel to these external violent activities, he describes the inner life of his friend as if he were trying to juxtapose the state violence and the state of his mind, in addition to his own interiority as a narrator. However, when we read the letter written by Dilawa to Swami, his words plainly express their anguish and failure of the nation state. For Swami, it was a movement to narrate his disillusionment not only with the police action, but the very nature of the two governmental systems that destroyed the pluralist ethos of everyday life in Hyderabad. Swami's literary career and personal life were indeed defined by this very movement of pluralist space as he began his literary work with the translations of Urdu short fiction writers, including Mountain, and his exposure to local Sufi networks. The characterization of the lover in Yugantam portrays the dynamics of this plurality, but Swami's lamentation about the unfortunate end also talks about several ends that described that, uh, that led to the destruction of, uh, destruction of Hyderabad. In Yugatam, Dilawar represents uh, his own anxiety as a Muslim and also his concerns about Hyderabad. So this is actually like uh, basically the interior story of Swami himself. In many ways, in the previous story, Sultan foregrounds a set of progressive and modernist concepts that Swami further elaborates in his later fiction. Deconstructing each practice of the Nawabi life in the city, Swami's characters offer a critical lens on that life and use various devices of resistance. While uncovering the sites of inner conflicts within the Muslim community, Swami also draws attention to the paradigmatic situations in which Muslims remain forever at a loss. Swami's fiction shows few characters such as Asim, Ruhi in other stories who were pushed to the ultimate oppression. From these limited examples of Muslim characters, we can see a diverse group of Muslim men and women as they navigate a new reality and a sense of being and belonging in the aftermath of the police action. In a discussion on the dynamics of Muslim identity before partition, the historian Barbara Metcalf observes three major arguments. One, rethinking the institutional changes and normative practices of organizations such as the Bigi. Number two, increasing the political presence and participation in alternative ways. And finally, number three, drawing attention to the image and metaphorization of Muslimness as articulated in the public imagination. Swami's um, short fictional work actually is in dialogue with this, all these changes. And the pluralist religious setting characterizes all these aspects of Muslim identity and the interactions between Muslims and Hindus. In this way, Hyderabad extends the legacy of its nature as an interreligious city, a term I borrow from Heather Miller Rubens, Umaira Zaid, and Benjamin Sachs. These scholars argue that the public square should be full of religious idioms and imaginaries that seek to apprehend, plain, as well as shape ideals and suggest solutions. They emphasize the empowerment of interreligious networks to speak in those idioms and raising interreligious literacy and invite the text that inspire individuals to become engaged citizens in the public square. Constructing such an idiom and creating an imaginary to represent various Muslim and Hindu characters that uphold the values of interreligiosity, Swami's writings actually create this kind of public sphere that invites the larger debates related to the Muslim question. Despite the limitations of any fictional testimony, the characterization of such an idea of a progressive and critical Muslim is articulated by diverse means in these writings. Most importantly, through alternative narrative agency, a forceful individual voice 
and a repertoire of recently available tools of resistance. Although these two terms define the contours of the life world of Swami's work, it is imperative to understand multiple strands of Muslim thought, global and local, that also shape the everyday and intellectual life of Swami and his characters. During the field research, I have met um, Jaini Malaya Gupta, who was one of the cultural activists in the 1940s, who emphasized it and then tried to contextualize what Swami did during his lifetime. He was talking about how progressive movement influenced local writers and then cultural teams. He particularly used two Urdu terms, Taraki Pasan and Adab. And the larger idea of socialism, of course, is in this discourse. Throughout our individual meetings in 2019, Gupta was very keen on using Marxian vocabulary, as was used by in more, many Telugu and Urdu writings of his day. He was quite insistent that the use of the specific term other, whenever I tried to use the Telugu equivalents during the conversation, focusing on how Tarakki Pasam and other produced an entirely new repository of concepts and practices in the social and political environment of Hyderabad, Gupta narrated his own story that started with the organization called Comrades Association. According to Gupta, not only writers, but even readers and ordinary people were immensely inspired by these new ideas. Growing up in such a milieu, Swami was likewise motivated partly by similar leftist ideas of focus, which were complemented by the debates on reformism and modern Islam. Swami's fiction captures the particular intense movement what Gupta was trying to explain as a witness. Swami grew up, of course, witnessing all these many changes in the everyday life of Hyderabad and had close associations with various social and cultural organizations of the society of the city about which uh, Gupta was trying to explain. He was in his late 20s when the city was being reshaped by the post fascist developments, including the police action and the resultant religious conflict. During one of my conversations with the well-known Telugu Urdu literary historian, Samala Sadasiva, he, who fondly remembered Swami and said, more than once, Swami spoke extensively about the police action that he had witnessed. He was lamenting the disappearance of the Hyderabadi Muslim legacy and the Urdu influence. Even now, Swami Samkhis are narrating the transforming psyche of his Muslim and Hindu friends remain intriguing in light of the post-2014 Telangana separatist movement. Various several studies focus on the violent side of the Hindu-Muslim interactions or gender issues during the post partition era. Swami's hybrid literary narratives that blend Urdu and Telugu elements offer insights into the value of everyday life and the refashioning of modern life by Muslims. He helps us to understand the ethics of coexistence between local Muslims and Hindus, thus raising a pertinent question of what being Muslim means in a pluralist socio-religious context, such as the city of Hyderabad. This new Muslim, as portrayed in Swami's narrative, was not a victim, but a survivor, not an individual imprisoned in the fixed interpretations of identity, but a champion of the modernist discourse. Towards this goal, this new Muslim even goes to the extent of challenging and contesting his, her family and community legacy. To put it briefly, this fictional world represents a pluralist cultural model that forthrightly respects multiculturalism and values the idea of multiple identities, the hallmark of the Hyderabadi culture. This idea of the new Muslim that began with Swami Sultan as articulated in local Islam arrives at another historical phase in the 1980s, turn of Muslim writing as a category. This entire journey from the police action to the 1980s Muslim writing has provided more political and cultural space for Muslim literary and political activism than pluralizing the Muslim narrative. Actually, that political story, that would be topic for my next topic 
hopefully somewhere. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Mohammed, for that amazing uh, presentation. I would now like to invite Professor Benjamin Cohen to have a discussion with Professor Mohammed, and also to the audience, if you would like to put in your questions at this point, please use the Q and A box or the chat box to do so. Great, thank you so much, um, Professor Mohammed. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, and also thank you to the British Library for hosting us virtually uh, today. So I wanted to start with a question about the, the location of the police action and the bigger story of modern South Asian history. You know, the princely states are often um, a, a small part of that story. And, you know, Hyderabad, I think, loses out to Kashmir when scholars talk about the role of the princely states around the time of partition. And so the police action is an event within Hyderabad state in a sense becomes a footnote on a footnote. And I'm wondering if you, if you agree with that and if you see your work and this presentation and the use of literary sources um, as well as archival sources is in a sense restoring the rightful place of Hyderabad and the police action to the story of India's independence, the post-partition years um, and the story of Hindu-Muslim relations. Thank you so much, Ben. So important question for me. It's also key for this entire uh, research and project. So, yeah, of course, uh, Hyderabad actually remained a footnote in many of these <laughs> stories and narratives, particularly the historical writings. For a particular reason that uh, for a long time, uh, we never discussed about what happened in Hyderabad city and uh, surroundings uh, during and after the police action, particularly those four days. And then, of course, um, we now have evidence that it's not just confined to those four days. It's like uh, until 1952, there was a lot of violence and suppression. So I actually wanted to uh, discuss about this geography of violence in my introduction to the book, but also uh, Eji Nurani, in his uh, destruction of Hyderabad, has a detailed uh, description about where exactly violence happened and then what how community like survived. And then, so he focused on that aspect. But in my field research, what I noticed actually uh, in the conclusion of this book, I am going to narrate one story about one Muslim who migrated to Hyderabad to escape state violence. And then he gathered like local Muslims, like few Muslims, handful of Muslims in his basti. And then he also later on uh, like uh, became an activist. So this is, but then when, he, when I was talking to him, I had like a very detailed uh, conversations with this person. And then I was so surprised, but when he was explaining me the incidents that happened, in Hyderabad and surrounding areas. Until then, we, we had no idea that there was such violence in Hyderabad and in surrounding regions as related to police action. Because uh, we, we hear more from Uspanabad, um, Nagpur, Bidar, and all these places, but we barely hear any story from Hyderabad. So one of the things that I am going to do uh, is to talk about, uncover those stories about violence. And then, um, unfortunately, some of my witnesses, uh, they passed away uh, uh, the last year after the COVID, and then because most of them 80 plus, and then that was so sad. I actually don't know how to digest this reality because I lost all my witnesses, half of the witnesses. I just have their voices on my iPhone. Yeah. And then I listen to those voices, both men and women. So, like, I uh, felt so bad. Well, how could we not, uh, why, could, why we're not talking about this history at all? Even now, because we barely touch those aspects because of the, like, uh, high emphasis on nationalism 
secularism, and also most important is the emphasis on leftist activism uh, uh, centered on Telangana armed struggle. Most of the time, leftists too, they were talking about like uh, this distinction between <laughs> house and have nots, class distinction, but never talked about uh, Muslims. So that's actually, I am, um, my effort is to explore that uh, geography of violence. But of course, my emphasis is not on violence and trauma, but I want to tell the story of remaking and refashioning of new Muslim identities. Mm. Makes sense. Mm. Thank you. In sort of talking about the making of a new Muslim identity, and I've got a, another question about that, um, I was struck both in the draft that you sent me and also in your presentation today, um, the lack of mention of the Nizam, right, who, who is sort of the epitome of the old Hyderabad Nawabi culture, if you will. And I wonder yeah. if you could say something about how um, how Swami treats the Nizam, if at all, in his writing, and how does how does Mir Usman Ali Khan fare in in, in <laughs> the literary stories about the police action? That's very interesting and intriguing question, Ben. I actually, had struggled so much to understand what how, how these people were looking at uh, Nizam. Of course, now at this point, in, even in Telugu, we have like uh, uh, some research being done about what Nizam actually did to uh, develop Hyderabad state, right. like Usmania University. And then, uh, so uh, actually in your favorite topic, uh, there is, I just read a book on water irrigation. So uh, there is also an argument that, okay, Nizam also did so much good. Only thing, like most of them, including leftist writers, Muslim writers, and the witnesses that, who like uh, gave the details of violence, they were all talking, they have this balanced viewpoint. Okay, Nizam did good stuff until the police action. <laughs> and also because of the political pressure, he became so weak and then he couldn't resist and then he couldn't fight. And then Sattar Patel's mission to destroy Hyderabad and the princely state of Hyderabad made him restless. And then at that moment, he depended uh, totally on Razakas. So that side of story, people like you know, critics, cultural activists, including the witnesses that I mentioned in my uh, this chapter, like Jaini Malaya Gupta, and then Samala Sadasiva, Guru Sitaram, like people like those, even though they have like a lot of respect, they had a lot of respect of these people are dead respect for uh, Nizam's uh, reformist uh, agenda, they couldn't buy that argument about Rajakas and then uh, uh, oppression and then a military face of that Rajaka. So they, but I see there is a balanced viewpoint right now. So we can see new histories coming now, um, talking about what Nizam actually did, and then why should we talk about Nizam's uh, uh, reformist agenda, particularly in the wake of Hindutva recently. Great. Um, so if, if, the, if the Nizam holds one location in Swami's writing and in the history of um, Hyderabad state in the 20th century, I was interested in, you know, and he's, he's of course an older figure. Um, <clears throat> it seemed that in uh, Swami's writing and the characters which you you read from in your presentation, that being in the 194 in you know post police action, um, being a new Muslim automatically meant that you were a young Muslim. And I'm interested in the role of generation here. And that is in Swami's writing, are there any elderly parents, for instance, who embraced that? new Muslim identity, or is it is it sort of a trope that the parents and the grandparents are stuck in the past and their sons and daughters and grandchildren are the only ones who are embracing the future? Can you say something about sort of that generational split, which becomes evident in the literature, yeah. um, but yeah. I'd like to hear you elaborate on that a bit. Yes, yes, thank you. That's also another uh, key question. And then, yes, uh, Obviously, there is a generational gap between 
like uh, maybe we are, when I spoke with uh, Jaini Malaya Kupta, who was 18 years old during the police action, who was also a good friend of uh, and then Sada Siva. They, they were good friends, the same age group. Uh, and then they, they had the same age group of Muslims as their friends from the old city of Hyderabad. So they were talking about this uh, generational gap. So 50, 40 plus Muslims, they, they were not actually like ready to accept <laughs> any like uh, version of modern Islam or reformism. So this is all happening between 18 and uh, 30 years old Muslim men and uh, women. In another story, actually Swami also describes about uh, women uh, where uh, actually uh, gender discourse and then that actually one of the primary uh, sources to discuss about gender discourse in Hyderabad city. So where he talks about one student who graduated from a medical college, she like uh, struggles with her parents, like when they support, okay, very like Islamic agenda. So we should stick to either Sunni, Shi version of Islam, traditional version of Islam. And then she sub, like well, challenges that idea. Why? Why do why do you should either become Sunni or Shi? I am I'm just Muslim. I just want to see this entire dilemma right now before my eyes as a Muslim. I uh, my entire struggle after the police action is to understand what is happening to Muslim women. So this kind of state that is basically like the age plays a big role. And then, and then uh, I just uh, like uh, there are numerous memoirs, uh, even published in uh, English and uh, Urdu that speak highly about Visa for a particular reason that. They were all written by 40 plus age group uh, persons. Even in Telugu, we have that kind of um, uh, dilemma. But of course, uh, Telugu historiography in Telugu is not that balanced. It's like uh, because most of these historians in Telugu, they were actually either influenced by nationalism or leftist uh, Marxian ideology. So they couldn't maintain a balance between uh, what is actually happening in the ground, on the ground and then how they, they are. I, I, for me, uh, they are a big failure in understanding the Muslim society of late 1940s. So they couldn't, uh, that generational gaps, even in literary writings, you can see those generational gaps. And uh, that's why uh, in the chapter I emphasized, it's happening only like Yangli, generation of uh, generation yeah it's there all yeah. yeah that it was it, it's clear in the chapter draft one of the other binaries which was very interesting to me and i think is really important for the audience to hear more about is the difference between the the way in which the police action played out in hyderabad city and in the villages and I'm wondering if you could say something about how Swami handles that sort of urban-rural divide and if, if there is a difference between how the police action and the aftermath are experienced in the urban core in the old city of Hyderabad, the epicenter of Hyderabad state, versus what's going on in smaller towns and villages uh, further afield. Can you sort of elaborate on, on how you see the difference playing out and if your work is adding in a sense new details about the police actions impact either in the city and or in uh, in the Mufasal. Okay, so you know, earlier I mentioned about one person who migrated from one village to city, right? So, and then I myself uh, born and grew up uh, in a kind of village setting, which is actually uh, away 150 miles from Hyderabad city, where actually that was my the early phase, earliest phase of research. Uh, when I, but that's why I mentioned about my previous work, 2006 and 2009, I met uh, some of the witnesses from my own 
hometown and also several villages in nalgonda mm. karimnagar um and then surrounding village with medak so these places even though they are away from city the house kind of away also from urbanity i hear a lot of violence they, they were telling about the, the stories about violence how they families were uprooted and then how some of their families uh, they migrated to pakistan to escape all these things so we, there is actually of course um, there is not much urban and uh, rural divide when it comes to violence uh, but hyderabad in a way uh, because of a uh, lot of activism at this point um, actually malaya gupta told me that hyderabad became like a safe place for him at this point like uh, there is leftist activism and then uh, and then in a way police and the military were not uh, like they were not that active in this space and then they just migrated to city and then settled there so a lot of migration happened from villages to uh, hyderabad city during this particular period between after the police action just to escape that violence even in this village Another another one of the interesting um, points that came up was uh, the role of Lucknow uh, and and sort of North Indian Islam is is being more progressive and it was interesting because you know Hyderabad and Lucknow have long sort of been in conversation with each other not only about who has the best biryani um, but the relationship <laughs> between you know North Indians. non mulkis um coming to hyderabad in the deccan to take up service during the time of the first salar jan and it was interesting to me that is you know swami as a writer in the middle of the 20th century is still invoking lucknow as yeah. <laughs> as this this special magical place that people should aspire to go to that that is where the modern <laughs> modern muslim modern islam is is located at but what do you i mean what do you think is it is it is it has it become a trope now that that lucknow is the the place to be and all eyes should be towards lucknow i what do you what, how do you respond <laughs> yeah in many stories uh, uh, written by swami and other fictional writers uh, in this particular period aligarh particularly and then sir sahed ahmed khan's philosophy in specific they are recurring themes but of course there is lot of uh, material out there to talk about why aligarh and then why sir sahed ahmed <laughs> uh, like uh, always returns in these stories new generation muslims for new generation particularly muslim um, youth aligarh and uh, ali like sir sahed ahmed khan they are great inspirations at that point mm. and then and then after of course there is also a tension between mulki and non mulki there but i i, I think when it comes to aligarh and uh, sir sahed ahmed khan's uh, legacy i don't see that kind of tension mm-hmm. so there is there is kind of uh, in when muslims like uh, speak about uh, all these intellectual uh you know, like influences particularly this uh, 20 plus but i had actually did interviews with some of the uh, organizations uh, that came up after the police action also i met the uh, this newspaper siyasas editor and then their family they they they, they all had great respect for aligarh and uh, sir ahmed khan even though they were uh, on the other hand emphasizing the Uh, importance of mulki but when it comes to muslim intellectual thought they take so much from north india no doubt about it yeah great um one of the things that i i very much appreciated uh in your talk and in the chapter draft was um that that excerpt about language memu and valu um you know you you and i um both work in urdu and telugu yours much better than mine 
Um, <laughs> but I, but, but let's, let's take it back to Swami's writing. And, and is, was that one of the few examples where that linguistic difference is used to tease apart Hindu and Muslim communities? Or is that, is that something that Swami and his short stories, do we see him playing with, with Telugu and Urdu language to, mm-hmm. to either bring the communities together or show the ways in which they're, um, they're, they're torn mm-hmm. apart? Is that, is that a characteristic of his, of his storytelling? Oh, that, that's quite interesting. When I came across uh, with this uh, usage of uh, us and them in Telugu context, and then also I heard the same from my like other act, cultural activists and political activists, like uh, when I met uh, Burgula Narsingh Rao, particularly he has the ultimately passed away last year. Uh, he was also using this kind of terminology because. After police action, they were very clear about this distinction between us and they. Also, within even within Muslim community, as I just explained in one of Swami's story, where uh, this medical graduate um, speaks about her own subjectivity, she also uses apne or paray they. So. It looks like after, because anyway, uh, after partition and then particularly in the case of Hyderabad, the police in the police action, uh, that kind of categorization is in a way kind of uh, very solid, whether it is in a village or in the city. So same, like Swami also actually using same idiom. And then actually many memoirs, autobiographical writings, Newspaper uh, pieces also like uh, talk about uh, this distinction between us and uh, them. Great. Maybe one more question from me, and then and then we can hear from the participants. <laughs> um, you know, I uh, hydro bodies are are um, fine, and I think it's not just hydro bodies alone. But there that sense of tazeev, that sense of nostalgia, and and. Uh, an imagining of a past. And, you know, while there's ample evidence of um, tremendous positive relations between all communities in Hyderabad, there's also some evidence of a lot of violence. You know, eyewitness accounts describe um, the, the bazaars of Hyderabad with nawabs and, and people armed to the teeth and, and the newspaper accounts of the 19th century um, are filled with accounts of clashes between different communities, not necessarily communal, but between one faction and another. And so I guess, in, you know, do you, do you think that um, is, is Swami's writing sort of playing on that nostalgia, or do you think he's drawn upon his own life experience growing up, as he says himself, you know, half Hindu, half Muslim, thinking of himself as cent per cent a hydrobody. Um, mm-hmm. did, does, it, how, do, how do we understand the, the counterfactuals to that sense of tazeev and um, this almost rosy past? Great. So for Swami, his entire fictional writing is autobiographical. Mm-hmm. Whatever he was writing, particularly about Muslims, Actually, the book itself, uh, Charminar title, the book is self uh, devoted to, dedicated to his uh, longtime friend from Hyderabad. Uh, so I hear that actually he actually uh, told the story in the character of the lover, as a Rajaka, right? But, so uh, for him, it is not nostalgia. For him, is actually like he was writing basically as a as an insider rather than just being Hindu doesn't make him outsider. He always claimed himself as an insider. And then all his friends consider him as like literally world city Muslim. <laughs> so it's kind of more, it's not nostalgia, of course, there is a certain element of nostalgia when he talks about 
mushairas uh, urdu poets and then the certain rituals and practices uh, about both muslim and hindus where muslims and hindus practice uh, this kind of little element of nostalgia but when i read the story it's not just about nostalgia he he was using nostalgia as a tool to articulate certain level of resistance that was being expressed by his muslim friends so this an interesting <laughs> uh, leveling of uh, nostalgia and uh, resistance there yeah it seems almost that that he's his young youthful characters are pushing off against that nostalgia as something right. <laughs> stuck stuck in the past yet it's exactly that kind of past that the police action seems to rupture um yeah. at the same time and there's 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 a lot of complexity and tension there mm, yeah so that is why i am more intrigued by his uh, fictional writing sometimes i feel like okay he's like giving me more details uh, rather than any historian <laughs> mm. good thank you so much professor mohammed thank you thank so you. much uh, ben this is wonderful all uh, big i'm going to i want to include all of your questions in my final manuscript thank you so much thank you both of you for that very engaging and very enriching session um i learned a lot uh <laughs> we have one question at the moment uh, so i'm going to take that and i would like to request uh, the audiences please feel free to put in your questions and uh, i'll read them out um the first question is from taylor sherman thank you for this great paper i really love the use of these sources to tell the story my question is the flip side of ben's first question to what extent in the sources you have examined where hyderabadis becoming part of india in new ways in this period for example was a new muslim defined in hyderabad itself or primarily through interaction with discourses and practices coming from the rest of india thank you so much uh, taylor sherman uh, so happy to hear from you in this uh, session and kind of uh, Uh, inspired by your work on police action so the question is basically like most of this um young uh, muslims during this point they were not identifying themselves with the big story of nationalist story of india they they were very clear enough to separate themselves from that nationalist narrative Uh, but only when when such some articulations when i read uh, the doctor uh, uh, works of swami i feel like that uh, they were actually because of their uh, struggle to break away from the past they were actually trying to like like it looks like uh, sometimes oh maybe they were buying this nationalist argument but uh including the main story you don't know which i just uh, um like uh, explained it also speaks much about that kind of uh, tension but i i don't believe uh even swami during his lifetime he actually never uh but the idea subscribed to this idea of nationalism and also most uh, muslims on the other hand that is one thing that is missing in uh, uh uh swami's uh short fiction but i get it from other autobiographical writings um that um, most muslims particularly the stotty plus age group muslims they were in dialogue with uh, what is happening worldwide as far as islam is concerned and then are there what kind of discourses uh were happening and then they, they were trying to like refresh of their everyday life after those uh new ideas hope that makes sense uh thank you professor mohammed i don't think we have any more questions so uh, while we wait for more questions professor cohen do you want to uh 
you know, do you have any more questions to ask? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to keep the conversation going. It's a real honor for me. So, um, Afsar, you know, one of the intriguing things about the police action has been the archival uh, access to archival, archival material. And you alluded to this at the beginning of your talk that some of the government reports surrounding the police action um, haven't been available. And that's made it more difficult for historians and uh, scholars from other fields to, to delve into um, what happened, or at least to understand the government's reporting of what happened. Um, do you have any updates for us on, on where, where we're at with the availability of sources regarding the police action? Oh, cool. Um, actually, the, the problem is, as you know, as a historian, we always look at conventional uh, sources, right? So until now, um, we're just looking at uh, like documents and then historical writings are uh, kind of that kind of con like conventional material. That is where, where actually I wanted to like uh, uh, take a detour and uh, okay, depend on um, this non-conventional sources and uh, that is what I call alternative archives, like literary fiction, uh, autobiographies and memoirs. Uh, and then of course, uh, journalistic writings also. Um, but the, the problem, even in uh, like, uh, we have Taylor Sherman here, who actually uh, used a lot of materials from Urdu and um, other kind of archives. Um, and then Nurani spoke also, like has gives us a sense of what kind of archives we can explore. Mm -hmm. And then Umar Khalidi himself has added uh, a lot of work uh, as far as archives are concerned. There is one limitation. Most of these archives are still limited to Urdu or English. Most, of course, uh, as far as Nizam's uh, governmental documents are concerned, most of them are also available in English anyway. So I, I want you to, I want to, to understand the story of local Muslims, we need to uh, use Telugu sources. So, which are actually nobody ever used them. Uh, or they, 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 need, they don't even, they never thought of using them, uh, considering them as historical sources. So, uh, but uh, when I started looking at these sources, I, I, every day I come up with one interesting source. Either a, either a story, a poem, or like there are also far popular folk genres uh, that speak about police action. So I know, my idea is... Yeah, also, also, your use of oral history, I think, is just fantastic. That, it's, it's tragic that that generation has reached a point where a lot of people are, are no longer with us, but, I, but it's great that you've been able to yeah. collect some of those, some of those stories. Um, Priyanka, back to you. Thank you. I think you have two more questions, or probably more than that, uh, but I don't <laughs> think we'll have time for all of them, so I'll try and take as many I can. Um, the first one is from Daniel Widman uh, Ibram. Another question asking for uh, your reflection on this, Afsar. I'm curious about how everyday hybridity or interreligious dimensions becomes not just legible in the comments, which it does, as you have chronicled here, in a literary historical imagination, but can be grounded as a force for organizing the workings of power. It seems that what we see is that monoreligious claims work in tandem with the exercise of power, while the lived interreligiosity is contained in everyday life from where, whence it sprang. How do we think about the limitations of hybridity or interreligiosity in the face of the exercise of monoreligious alignment with state power. Just curious Thank about you. your reflections on this. Thank you, Daniel. Of course, you know response to this question, I know. <laughs> so particularly at this point, that's why I actually, I uh, wanted to talk about uh, new Muslim writing in Telugu letter, but uh, where you can clearly see what kind of uh, tension we can, like uh, capture. So, um, but of course, uh, 
uh, power actually plays a crucial role in constructing this kind of hybridity or uh, countering the hybridity. So in 1998, when I witnessed Advani's uh, speech in Hyderabad, uh, when he was talking about police action as a day of liberation, so that actually, that discourse is still out there, very powerful. So it's also impacting everyday life. So I actually, when I uh, started writing about uh, one autobiography written by one uh, Telangana freedom fighter and who also witnessed police action and the Telangana armed struggle, he lived in Hyderabad throughout his life. Then he was good. Uh, he was totally influenced by Urdu uh, sphere. So even when he was writing this autobiography uh, around the same time, 1998 and in 2000, uh, there were voices. Oh, why you are writing about Muslims? Why you are not talking about Radhakas? Why you are talking about Nizam? So they are kind of uh, being a Marxist. We don't accept this kind of uh, Nizam-centered writings. Uh, so that kind of element is still strong out there. But what I see in everyday life, that is where the new mode of Muslim writing after 1980s and then recently after 2010, it became a very powerful trope uh, in contemporary Telugu writing. They actually trying to make a distinction between this Hindutva centered idea of Hyderabad and then this idea of uh, in a way, I, I would say it's a little progressive. That is the term, simple term, but I just want to use it to make a distinction between these two practices. But I see particularly those writers, activists, and then some of the activists and uh, Urdu, from the Urdu sphere, they also speak about this kind of progressive hybridity. I hope that uh, it's, it's a big question. I, it's not easy to respond anyway. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, the next question is by Zehra Sabri. Thanks for an exciting, informative talk. Would it be possible to talk about continuing social, cultural, and intellectual links between Hyderabadis in India and the Hyderabadi community in Pakistan. For example, how much did Telugu materials um, enjoy an audience among Pakistani Hyderabadis? At least among the first generation, there must have been several migrants who knew Telugu and read Telugu literature alongside Urdu literature. Thank you, Jahra. That is very important question as far as uh, Telugu Urdu exchanges are concerned. I don't think, uh, uh, any writings uh, in Telugu, they are being read uh, in Pakistan. And then, of course, I wish they could be read there. Uh, but I, I see a lot of uh, Urdu writing uh, in Telugu, particularly. So you know about Ibrahim Jalis, who actually published an autobiographical uh, kind of memoir, Do Mun Kuyat Kahani two regions, two countries, two states, and one story. So where he actually, Ibrahim Jalis, uh, he worked in Deccan Radio. So that kind of, we have a lot of uh, interaction between Urdu to Telugu, but not like Telugu to Urdu. Maybe at some point, uh, because this uh, aspect of bilingualism is fading out. So you don't see like that kind of scholars, for instance, Swami, and then the, all the witnesses that I presented today, all of them, they grew up reading Urdu literature. They, they were engaging with Urdu sphere. But uh, in, in like in after 1998, maybe after police action, I could say after police action, that connection was lost. So people are either reading Telugu or Urdu, that's it. There is no link between two languages. So that's a very sad situation. It's also like a post-colonial uh, tragic irony, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, there are 
like figures like uh, cultural figures like uh, Savana Sadasiva, about whom I mentioned, he actually did a lot of effort to cultivate taste for a Urdu spear in Telugu for the last 35 years. But it is partly successful. Well, I, I don't see that possibility of Pakistanis uh, reading this kind of material there. But I, I read a lot of <laughs> uh, autobiographical writings and memoirs by Pakistanis about Hyderabad. But in, in Urdu, of course, uh, one chapter I'm going to discuss about Jilani Banu, Urdu writer, uh, and then the role of her, uh, that novel's translation in Telugu public sphere. So uh, she also talks a lot about this uh, Hyderabadi and the Pakistani exchanges. But a lot of writers, they still like uh, talk about that interaction, but uh, the linguistic exchange is no more. It's very, very, very poor. Thank you. Um, uh, we don't have time for any more questions, but if you would like, I can read out the third question if it, if you want to think about it later or if, quickly if you want to answer it. Um, the question is uh, from Ayub Khan. Are there hints in Swami's works or other Telugu literature about nostalgia of Hyderabadi Muslim migrants to Pakistan and elsewhere? Urdu literature mm -hmm. addresses it, but I'm curious of Telugu literature. There is also, as of yet, under-analyzed an literature of Hyderabadi refugees in USA. I am so happy to hear from you. Yes, of course, uh, Swami's story, Yugantam, that I mentioned here, that's actually about uh, uh, Dilawar's migration to Pakistan. And then the book also devote, dedicated to like his friend who migrated to Pakistan. So that actually, that is kind of narrative recurring theme in not only in Urdu, just like I mentioned Jilani Bano right now, even in the writings in Telugu of the post uh, police action, there are like few novelists, particularly there is a novel uh, about uh, who migrated to Pakistan and then also returns to Hyderabad at some point. So they talk about the tensions between Hyderabadi identity and then the Pakistani identity. Actually, Pakistan, you know, is not just a kind of geography, right? It's also a metaphor, right? In many ways, right? So in many of these writings, particularly in a fictional writing, that return to Pakistan articulates a desire to embrace kind of um, traditional Muslim identity. But I, I still have to explore the possibilities of uh, like uh, other sources, like uh, I'm sure there are numerous sources. Thank you so much, Professor Afsar Muhammad and Professor Benjamin Cohen for that fascinating session. Thank you very much. Thank you to our audiences for joining us tonight. Please join us next week, 23rd August, same time, 5.30 p.m. for a seminar uh, presentation by Dr. Seuti Sabur from Brack University in Dhaka. She will be speaking on formation of the middle class in Bangladesh, and the session would be chaired by Professor Dina Siddiqui from NYU. So do join us. Um, thank you, stay well, and uh, good night to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.